Looking to showcase your product or service? There's no better place than the AFCA convention, which will take place January 8th through the 10th in 2023 in Charlotte, North Carolina. The AFCA convention is an opportunity to exhibit in front of over 7,000 coaches and staff members. Head on over to convention.afca.com for more information. See you in Charlotte. This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring Miami University, Ohio's special teams coordinator, Jacob Bronowski. Coach Bronowski talks about his journey to special teams coordinator, how he adjusts for close games, and how he navigates being a great coach and a great family man. Now, let's get inside the headset with Coach Bronowski. Coach, what's going on, man? How are you? Oh, I'm doing best ever, man. We're just ripping and running here. You guys are getting after the uh, in the off season workouts. And we're running. Yeah, man. Oh, and ripping and running is a 365 uh, <laughs> day a year That's right. job these days, man. So uh, I appreciate you carving out a little time to spend with us, man. Um, I just want to rewind back, kind of get this thing started. Uh, you were a special team student assistant uh, to kind of jump your career off. What, you know, at what point did you decide this is what you wanted to do? Uh, you know, did you go you no know, going into college? Did you fall in love with it? You know, what was that 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 moment in time that you knew you wanted to coach? Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I tell you what, it, uh, I knew early on, right? Like, I grew up playing high school football in, in the state of Texas. You know, I played at Amos College there in College Station, Texas, and so the Friday Night Lights was. I mean, it was real for me, and I was blessed enough to have awesome coaches in high school um, that are head coaches now all over the state of Texas, yeah. and. You know, just seeing how those guys interacted with me, like, dude, it, it, it set the tone very early on that I was going to be a, a college football coach. Like, that's what I wanted to do. And so when I went to New Mexico, you know, I went there as a player. I played quarterback and ended up getting hurt. And, and so at the time, Bob DeBest was the offensive coordinator there. And so he brought me in. Luckily, we had a prior relationship. And, and so he kind of always looked out for me, which I was very appreciative of. And anyways, and so he, he brought me in and said, look, like, this is an opportunity for you, right? Like, you can be a student system. You want to get into coaching. And I didn't even know, to be honest with you, at the time, that that was even a thing. You know, like, our staff in New Mexico was really, really small. Bob Baby was the head coach. Yeah. And, and, and so anyway, so I go in and I meet with Coach Baby, and, and they, he told me, like, dating back to my time as the head coach in Notre Dame, you know, I never had a student system. And so he wasn't comfortable because, again, he was very closed over with the day-to-day operations of the football program. And so he's like, here's the deal. I want you to go in and be a, a equipment manager for a year. You know, and so I left and I said, absolutely, I'll do that. But then I left. I called my mom, but frankly, and I was like, look, mom, I'm like, I don't know if this is what I want to do. You know, like this isn't the route I want to go. And, you know, and she gave me some great advice and, and holds through to a lot of situations. Right? But she's like, you know, there's, there's things a lot of times in life that you have to go through, you know, to achieve the things that you want to get. get. Um, and, and maybe it's having to do something you don't want to do to get those things. And you know what? That year that I had down in that swimming room, like it was the best year I could have. You yeah. know, like it was something that it set me up. Like it gives me a great deal of appreciation to what those guys do on a day to day basis. And, and you know how it is. Like being special teams coordinator, I'm probably the biggest pain in the butt on a day to day basis because yeah. I got the most equipment. I got the jugs machines, firing balls everywhere. Right. Um, and so it gave me a great deal of appreciation to those guys. But ultimately, obviously, I segue into being a student assistant my junior and senior year. And man, that, that was a great opportunity. You know, I learned so much from a lot of great coaches. And, and because it was such a small staff, staff like I alluded to, dude, they gave me, they gave me the opportunity to wear a lot of hats. Like, I mean, I was a special team quality control when I was a junior in college, right? And, and I was still helping out with offense. I mean, I got to wear a lot of hats and recruiting. I was doing a lot of things with our recruiting coordinator at the time. So those are all things looking back that, man, those are valuable learning experiences for me and, and ultimately shaped me to who I am today. No question. I mean, you, you talk about, uh, the, the typical trajectory, you know, got, plays his career five years, you know, including a red shirt year, you know, for most, most people and maybe a year or so where they're trying to decide what they want to do. And so most people are getting that experience that you were getting as a 20 year old or 19 year old, uh, you know, that most people are getting at 24, 25, uh, at the, at the FBS level, nonetheless. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been in a couple of programs that are like that there, you know, might be a big program on paper, but ultimately the operation is relatively small in terms of, of help Absolutely. and all that kind of stuff. And so you end up with a ton of experience and ultimately a tough decision about maybe being an equipment guy for one year turns into, you know, this stint, this run, it's almost about 10 years of you only working at the division one level, you know, all because you did make, maybe make that 
make that decision to 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 go and kind of cut your teeth in the equipment room a little bit. So that is a that 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 certainly is a blessing. Now, uh, how how did you get tied in with special teams? And that's you know, as a quarterback, typically you guys don't do anything but hold the, you know, typically hold the hold the ball for the field goal kicker. And uh, you know, it seems like I mean that that you kind of made a name for yourself as a special teams guy uh, throughout your career. So how did you get less on to that? Yeah, you know, funny story. So it was uh, it was June second, uh, two thousand fourteen. Uh, that was our day that we were reporting to the office. You know, after spring recruiting at the time and all that, and and I'll never forget that day because shoot, that was the first day that I got to be a Division one football coach. Whether it was a student assistant or not, in my mind, I was a Division one football. Coach. No doubt, that was my mindset going into it. Right. And so I mean, I'm ready. I they finished up the staff meeting. You know, it wasn't until year two I got to go to the staff meeting. So year one, I was I was going outside of the staff meeting. Um, but then they finished up the staff meeting about 8.45, and I'm walking down the hallway, you know, to the offensive unit meeting with the, with the offensive staff. You know, I'm excited, right? Like, I'm freaking – I made it. You know, I got my I got my little notepad, and I'm ready to go be the next Cliff Kingsbury and go reinvent the game and whatever it is. <laughs> and uh, Derek Wareheim was the special team coordinator at the time, and he, he hollers from his office. He's got a real thick Oklahoma accent. Yeah. yeah he's the best. And uh, he, he hollers from his office. He says, hey, Jake, come here. And so I come walking in, and he says, look, I need a guy to help me on special teams. And, and I've heard some good things about you. You're going to be my guy. So I'm like, heck yeah, coach, you got it. Like, whatever you need. And then, but in my mind, I'm like, son of a gun, like I was a quarterback. Like I was throwing a mess. I don't know anything about that. Right. Like I couldn't tell you anything. Like other than the fact that the field goal kicker took the ball. Like that's it. And, and obviously now looking at it, but man, that was the biggest blessing in my life because yeah. that, that really is who I am. Right. Like special teams, there's so many hats you have to wear. And, and it all comes down to technique and effort, and that's what I believe, and that's what I love. And, and you get to develop a relationship with every single guy, yeah. you know. And that's the stuff that I didn't understand about special teams until after that first year. And, and like I said, I was blessed to work with him that first year because he, he's a pro, and how he goes about things on a day to day basis, I couldn't have asked for a better person. Yeah, you know, something that's interesting. I've had this opportunity to ask a question a couple of times on the podcast where. I got you know myself for instance, I played running back. You know, you go to college, you get a running back's job. And then all of a sudden you end up maybe playing, you know, coaching linebackers, something outside your comfort zone. It sounds like this is the same thing, right? You, you quarterback your whole life and all of a sudden you really didn't do anything on special teams. Um, do you feel like that's maybe like you said, I know you just said it was an ultimate blessing, but like maybe not having that pre previous knowledge actually probably propelled your career. Cause I'm assuming you went and, all right, you know, I got to learn all this stuff. You know, you know, maybe as if if they stuck you with the quarterbacks, like which I'm I'm assuming you thought maybe that was going to be the case. You know, you wouldn't have been as driven. And I know you're a coach, so it's hard to always say to ask that question because I know you're you're going to be naturally driven. But some stuff would have been more natural to where you didn't have to go get outside your comfort zone and go learn. You know, did, did does that sound any you know is that accurate at all? The way I'm kind of phrasing that. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean I'm I'm a firm believer that. Your most your, your most growth and your development comes from when you're uncomfortable, you know, and that's that's ultimately why I've taken some jobs, right? Because I felt like I, at the end of the day, I started to develop a level of comfortableness. Right? I don't even know if that's a word, but yeah, you develop that, and so in order to get better, you got to be uncomfortable, you know. And I preach that for a guy, and, and so that's something that's a core value and a belief of mine. And so, yeah, you're 100 percent right. Like there might have been things that. And even though I didn't know all the answers as, as a quarterback by any stretch, you know, I was a walking quarterback there, but you know, I, I felt like I had a good foundation. Yeah. You know, I played for some really good high school coaches and all that. And so, um, yeah, there probably would have been some things that maybe I would have brushed aside, but you know, being that my teams are getting cut in special teams, like, dude, I had to make up a lot of ground and I had to make it up quick, you know, yeah. because Coach Ryan didn't have anybody else. Like, I was his guy and I didn't want to let him down, right? Because he was a great person and he took me under his wing. So, I and mean, I spent as much time as humanly possible of learning this stuff. And, and luckily at the time we had some great VAs too that, that helped me out along the way and just kind of took me under their wing. Um, but yeah, you're, that's, a, that's a great question and 100%. Now, as, as far as, uh, you know, at what point did you actually start running every single unit out there on the field where you were responsible for all four phases, you know, of the special teams? Um, you know, because uh, oftentimes, you know, especially if you're uh, – um, a, you know, assistant or a QC, maybe, maybe not necessarily you don't have your hands on everything. At what point were you, you know, were you calling, you know, the kickoff, kickoff return, the punt and the punt return, you know, organizing that, you know, strategizing, watching the film on that? Was that kind of the whole career or, or was there a specific time where you took all, over all four units? Yeah, I mean, I would say it really started my, my first year as a graduate assistant at New Mexico. I was working with the wide receivers and special teams and we had a really unique setup there. Um, Apollo Wright, who again talked about mentors, and he's he's one of my 
I mean, he was in my wedding. He stood up there with me on my wedding day. So that tells you enough about him and our relationship. But he was a special teams coordinator and quarterback coach. Okay, so that's probably the first time in your podcast you've ever heard. Of I've never heard of that coach. ever. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I mean, shoot again, looking back, what a blessing for me. Yeah. Right. Like had the opportunity because he ultimately had a lot of faith in me that I had the opportunity to game plan all, pretty much our entire special teams game plan of the week because obviously he game plan for quarterbacks and getting third down looks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so um, and he put a lot of faith in me, and, and obviously we still did a lot of it together. Right. Uh, every night we would get together and kind of go through stuff, but it was, it was usually me for him first. And then my second year, I actually got moved down to the field, um, and that's when I really started calling everything. You know, there would be things that we would talk about in the headset, but for the most part, I was calling our front team, the kick off the front team based on what they were doing, making those in-game adjustments that you have to make on special teams pretty much on the fly because, you know, guys are going to play defense, guys are going to play offense, he's grabbing guys here and there. Um, and so, so really, so that set me up to ultimately when I got to Robert Morris and I was the guy and I was a special team coordinator by title, just through, I didn't have some of those first year going things because I had already gone through those. And I had already experienced those, um, which again, like you, you don't realize in the moment, but man, how valuable those situations, those moments are. Um, and, and always, you know, going back and self reflecting in those moments too. Like that's important as a coach. Like yeah. if you're not doing that, you know, you miss out on those, those learning experiences. That you may not have ultimately gotten. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, obviously, my career got uh, shifted to to come here to the AFC. But my last job was was a special teams coordinator, and you know, I, no shame about it, man. I you know, ultimately, I felt like I did a tremendous job. But man, I I, I walked in the games and I was so nervous just about the organization, making sure I didn't have two players on the field with the same number. What if the <laughs> left cornerback pulls a hammy and nobody tells me? You know, just all the anxiety that comes with running such a uh, a diverse unit you know if you're an offensive coordinator I'm not saying it's an easy job but you know you you send 11 guys out there it varies just slightly you know 11 to 15 different guys you know early in the game that you're going to be kind of kind of sending out on the field for the most part you know depending on personnel defensively kind of the same thing but you go to special teams I mean it's it's 27 28 different guys you know based on the units of, of who's running out oh, yeah. there and sort of some of that organization uh, and just just preparedness, you know, had me always at the edge of my seat every year, and and maybe that allowed for me to do well. But it is a lot that goes into being a, a quality special teams coach, man. Um, now, uh, Tyler Stockton, he was a part of our thirty five hundred thirty five program. You know, defensive coordinator, uh, did a tremendous job for us, and. Uh, I, you know, so I ended up watching some some of those some action over the last couple of years and stuff like that. And so I know you guys ended the season with a seven and six record, a bunch of close close games, right? Um, you know what, what what were especially as a special teams coordinator because you know sometimes your you know, field position and you know some plays here and there can be so pivotal. You know what are some of the stuff that you guys are implementing to overcome some of these tough moments? You know, with with, with three of those games coming, you know, less than a touchdown, uh, you know, losses. You know, what what are some of the things you guys are doing? Absolutely. No, that's a great question. You know, that was something when I first got here, obviously looked at and saw, I mean, that, that's what's fun about the match, you know, I mean, across the board, I mean, it's, it's tight football games and as a coach, that's what you, you're excited about, right? right? And so, you know, from day one, Coach Martin uh, set the tone with our first team meeting when I brought our guys back in January, you know, and, and the whole message was it's going to take every single guy in this room pulling in the same direction in order for us to go achieve the things that we want to go achieve. You know, and he talked about it because obviously I wasn't here last year, but he talked about how, you know, last year ultimately it came down to four possessions and really one possession against Penn State and we're going to the next championship. Yeah. There's all it takes is in those moments, in those tight football games, is one guy not doing something for himself or maybe not locked into the, to the game plan or whatever it is. It just takes one guy right. and all of a sudden all that your season comes down to that one play or that one possession. And so, I mean, that was his big message from day one. And so, like he talked about, like I took that for special teams. To me, close football games, you win those or lose those on special teams. Yeah. My whole message is we're going to control field position. We're going to win the battle field position. And we're going to make explosive plays when we're given the opportunity. But it's, it's the nature of it. You have so few plays that you don't ultimately always get those opportunities in. But no matter what, when we go out there and punt the ball, like this is the standard, this is the expectation. Like we're going to have a giant chunk of yardage exchange on this play. Yeah. And, and gosh darn it, we're going we're gonna to cover the heck out of that punt. We're going to protect the heck out of it. And we're going to cover it, right? And that's a big play. You know, you, you net punt 44 yards in the game, and that's the only thing you do. Well, that's a huge play in that game. That's an explosive play. And so, um, so I, that's what I really preach to our guys. And then the other thing I took to on special teams, right? Like taking with his message and projecting it to our team, because I get to talk to everybody on yeah. a daily basis. 
is just the understanding that every play has an opportunity to make or break a game. Every single play. And so the only way to get yourself truly ready for that is, is to go about things with the mindset that we have to capitalize on opportunities. And the only way to do that is, is, is ultimately by our practice habits. Right? Because your practice habits become your game reality. And so what I do on special teams is every single day, there's an effort and a technique grade that we give our guys. And every single day going into the practice, I give them the two things I want them to worry about. Like, hey, look, if, it's, if we're working on button base for kickoff, the only thing I want to work on is us not building our base prior to contact. I want us to build our base through contact. I want to see us, you know, active feet in a violent snap. Like, those are the two things I want to work on. Yeah. So can we go out? Sure. Is it is it hard to go out there and worry about a million different things like they all have to, especially talking about spring ball, like young guys going through things, you know, learning the new playbook on defense and offense, 100%. But if I can narrow that down as a coach, well, then it lets those guys understand, like, okay, these are the practice habits I have to develop. And, and, and pointing those out to guys. You know, like, I, I vividly remember we have an all-conference linebacker. And, dude, we're doing a punt return drill, and that sucker's standing in the back of the line for five straight minutes until he gets his, to his rep, right? He does a rep, he goes back. For five straight minutes, I'm watching him in the background step into his target and shoot his hands out of his punt return stand. So I'm going to show that in the meeting. Like, that's a dude that's an all-conference linebacker. So now that that freshman, he sees that, and like, that's the standard now. And that's how we ultimately get every single guy pulling, you know, in the same direction so we can go achieve those things. Because the one thing I've learned, I don't care if it's Mountain West, the NEC, the SEC, the margin for winning in college football is so small. And, and guys don't understand that it's yeah. easy to gain those feet. But when you talk about gaining those inches, that's what's hard. But it yeah. ultimately isn't that hard because you're talking about doing little things at a consistent rate all the time, doing them the light way. Right. And that's how you ultimately become great. There's no doubt about it. Well, hey, um, you know, I, I did, before I hopped off, which is, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, your family. You know, you talked about when a coach has been your best man at your wedding, and uh, I was going to interject there, but this is kind of perfect time. Uh, you just introduced your second son uh, to your family here. Um, you know, every one of your jobs is, like I mentioned, has been an FBS uh, or, you know, FCS job, a Division One job. And, you know, there's, there's a lot that comes with holding those types of responsibilities. There's a lot of hours that get poured into that. How have you maintained some of that work-life balance have you, as you've been married and introduced kids into your lifestyle? Um, you know, how, how have you been able to be a great father, husband, and ball coach? Yeah, no, see that. I don't know if the word balance, you ever get that in our profession, as you know. Um, yeah. What I've really learned, and, and this is something, man, like when I was at Robert Morris, it, it wasn't, I was not a, at any threat by any means good at this. You know, like I was young, I still am relatively right, but um, you know, I was lucky enough to work with Coach Clark there, Bernard Clark, and he's an incredible human being on a lot of different levels. And, and he was he has a great feel and a great pulse for the guys that work for him. And, and he, I remember him bringing me in multiple times and talking to me about about that, right? Like Jake, you gotta figure out a way to not take this stuff home with you, not take yeah. your job home with you and, and all those things. And in my mind at times, I'm like, what's he talking about? But then really and truly he was right. Yeah. And and so um the thing I've learned, because again, the balance you got is hard. You have to be organized um in order to do that. But the thing I've learned, especially now that my, my oldest son Brody is he's turned three here in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, so now um with him, like I come home and he's yelling dad and daddy and all those things, and like he he knows by right, when I'm home and so what I've learned is, is it often comes down to a little more quality over quantity. Yeah. Like, like when I'm home, I got to be present. Right. You know, I, I can, I can get home at a good hour. I can spend my time with my son and go out. Like what the other night I went out and hit some golf balls with him. And I can go do those things. I can do his bedtime routine. And then I'm still able to, after that, you know, after I invest into my, in some time into my wife and obviously now our, our newest son, then I'm able to go and, and maybe make some of the food calls and, and those kind of things. Like, so it comes down to time management with a lot of that stuff, but and then it, the, the root of it is just quality of the client. And being present in those moments, and being there for, for my wife, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, like, I couldn't do any of this if it wasn't for her. You know, Stacey's amazing. She, she is as invested in this as I am. You know, she looks at our players like, like they're our kids. And I think that's important as a coach because I think that also gives you, you know, it's one thing for her to be, you know, reading all the blogs and things like that. That's not what she's doing. She's invested in, in our career because it is us, right? It takes two of us. She's going through four moves in three years. Like she's going through everything that I am. She's probably going through it more because she's doing it with our kids. Yeah. Um, so seeing that from her side, I think also helped me um, to be a better dad and to be a better husband. So 
hope I answered that. Yeah, you did, man. And, uh, you know, I'm always looking for little nuggets, but, I mean, quality over quantity, that sums it up, you know. Because uh, as you said, the balance thing, it, you're never going to have 12 hours at work and 12 hours at home. You know, it just doesn't work like that. So it's uh, it is, uh, to, you know, taking advantage of that qual of that time and making it quality time. Well, coach, I appreciate the time with you, man. Um, looking forward to keeping up with some with some action again this year. Be rooting you guys on as, as usual. Um, if you don't mind sharing your social media account, your Twitter account, you know, just anywhere you, you maybe post some stuff. And if anybody wants to ask questions or keep up with you, they can follow you there. Absolutely. No, it's uh, at Coach Jay Blonowski. So, yeah, by all means, I always try to post, keep it, keep it pretty live on there. All right, cool. Well, we'll make sure to link that in the show notes, make it easy for coaches to find. As always, man, uh, I definitely appreciate you, you know, taking the time to, to, to kind of share with us and uh, look forward to seeing you in Charlotte, okay? Yeah, no, thank you, and thank you so much for everything that you guys do. You know, hope I don't know if this thing uh, – going to increase y'all's uh, viewership but man i had a great time <laughs> well yeah well, hopefully we, we get some uh get some miami fans on and uh yeah, all that good stuff so we appreciate it man hey man thank you so much all right thanks for listening to this week's episode of inside the headset if you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes while you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at afca.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at We Are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.